Believe it or not, we are midway through the NFL season and some teams are extremely pleased with their draft picks while others are having second thoughts. Draft weekend is hugs and kisses and it's truly a special time in both players and families' lives. But after that, it's time to get to work and to prove why you were a first round draft pick. And we all know why we're here. In today's video, we will be grading the 2024 NFL Draft midway through their rookie year. Today's video will be picks 1 through 16 and there will be a video next week grading picks 17 through 32. Before we get started, I do want to make a quick note. JJ McCarthy sustained a season-ending injury in the preseason, and Michael Penix is a backup to Kirk Cousins. Both players will take over at some point, but when it is time to discuss those picks, both of those selections will receive an incomplete grade. We will be going in reverse order from 16 to 1, so we will start with Seahawks defensive tackle Byron Murphy and finish with Bears quarterback Caleb Williams. We all know why we're here, so let's begin! Byron Murphy was the Seahawks' first-round pick and the first pick of the Mike McDonald era. Murphy was a very good defensive tackle prospect from Texas, and it definitely wasn't a sexy pick by any means, but one that Seattle desperately needed. The Seahawks were absolutely gashed against the run in 2022 and 2023, and Murphy was supposed to help against the run while also being able to get after the quarterback. Murphy played the first three games, and Seattle was 3-0 in those games. He then missed the next three, and Seattle was 0-3 in those games. Unfortunately, they are just 1 and 2 since he came back, but Seattle is averaging 122 rushing yards per game allowed when Murphy plays and averaged 173 rushing yards per game when he was out of the lineup. Obviously, it doesn't all attribute to Byron, but he has been a good contributor both as a run defender and pushing the pocket. Defensive tackles are at a disadvantage from the national media standpoint because Byron will never lead the league in sacks and he's never going to lead the league in tackles either. But Murphy is a rock solid player and he will be the anchor of this defense for years to come. I love this pick from the moment it was made because he went to a team that desperately needed him. This will improve with time, but for now it's a B+. Layatu Latu was the first defensive player taken in the 2024 draft at number 15 overall and through half a season, Latu is currently third in rookies and pressures with 20 through 9 games and is behind two Rams players in Jared Verse and Braden Fisk. The biggest thing that has to be remembered about rookie edge rushers is they're going to take time and Latu is no exception. He had a big sack against the Bears back in week 3 and there's been several flashes from Latu early in his rookie year that I think he's going to figure it out. He just needs some time. Obviously, Latu has no control over this, but I do get really frustrated with how Colts games play from a time of possession standpoint, and I think that sets their entire defense up for failure, which of course includes Latu. I would be surprised if he ever leads the league in pressures or sacks, but I think he has a very high floor as a player and will be the player the Colts wanted Quiddy Pay to be. Even as a rookie, Latu is a solid pass rusher and he shows that with his bag of moves on a week-to-week -week basis. I would I'd like to see him finish his rookie year with roughly 45 pressures and 6-7 to seven sacks, and it is important to note he is a bit of an older rookie, but I like what we've seen so far, a B-plus grade. Talisi Fuaga was an underrated tackle prospect in what was a very strong draft class. He started the year off by allowing a grand total of zero pressures in his first two games. The Saints absolutely killed the Panthers and Cowboys in those first two games, but it's been downhill for the Saints since. And Fuaga has also had several rookie moments since then, and the Chiefs and Broncos game were particularly rough for him. And this is in pass protection to be clear. There's been several clips where Fuaga is out on the run, and you can tell he is one of the most athletic tackles in the league, and he has been very good in the run game. But left tackles aren't drafted to be run blockers, even despite how good Fuaga is as a run blocker. Since weeks 1 and 2, he has a pressure rate allowed of 9.3% and this is one of the trickier picks to grade because the flashes have been there and especially early on, but it's usually the opposite for rookies. Usually they struggle early on and develop later in the year. Now, Fuaga is credited with allowing five sacks, although I don't think all of them were specifically on him as sometimes quarterbacks walk right into sacks, which then go on linemen and certainly don't do their linemen any favors in the process. I think Fuaga is a very good player and I do think he will be a saint for several years. And this team is going to need players to build around because they are in a tough situation. Right now, this is a B+. Brock Bowers was the best tight end in the draft and it wasn't particularly close. And half a season into his career, Brock Bowers is already one of the best at his position. I don't know how hot of a take this is, but I personally think Brock Bowers is already a top 5 tight end in the NFL and I don't think it's a debate. 
He is the definition of a nice car in a bad garage meme, and to put some numbers behind the year Brock is having, he is currently top 5 in the NFL in receptions and top 10 in receiving yards. And we don't really have to discuss the quarterback play with Brock because we know it's not good. Not even close. But Brock is also leading tight ends in receptions and receiving yards, and I think what's most impressive about this is he's doing it at 21 years old. Transitioning to tight end is very difficult because you really have to do it at two positions, both as a run blocker and as a receiver, and you can't be a liability. Brock dominated the SEC for a couple of years, and he's dominating the NFL too. I really hope for the sake of Brock's career, the Raiders get him a quarterback this offseason because he is about as friendly of a target as you're going to find. I thought he would be good, but I didn't think he would be this good. An easy A+. Bo Nix was the 6th quarterback drafted in the first 12 picks and through 9 games has close to 1,800 yards, 8 passing touchdowns, and 6 interceptions. He also has been a really good dual threat quarterback too and has an additional 295 rushing yards and 4 rushing touchdowns. He would be on pace for 3,300 passing yards, 15 passing touchdowns, and 550 rushing yards and 8 rushing touchdowns. I have to be honest, I think Bo has played a lot better than people initially thought he would, and I think what gets forgotten gotten in the national media, or at least not acknowledged, is Bo has improved quite a bit since the start of the season just a few months ago. Bo's first two games were against a Mike McDonald-led defense in the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he came out and threw four interceptions in the first two games, and not surprisingly, the Broncos lost both games. But since then, Denver is 5-2, and two, and Bo has eight passing touchdowns to just two interceptions, and has played a lot better. And the supporting cast Bo has is what you would expect for a number one overall pick to have, not the number 12 pick in a team that's 5-4 and four through 9 games. Nix obviously hasn't been perfect, but he's been a lot better than I think even Broncos fans could have hoped for. He's led the team in rushing multiple times, and the plan for Denver this offseason is simple. Build around Bo, an A- grade. Olu Fashinu was the Jets' first round pick, and Olu was a player I liked a lot coming out of Penn State. I also made a video prior to the draft about dream landing spots for a couple of prospects, and I included Olu going to the Jets as one of them. Heading into the year, I knew Olu wasn't going to start right away, as Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses were the slated starting tackles, but I knew Tyron hadn't played a full season in nearly a decade, meaning Olu was going to play at some point. Having said all of this, I don't think Olu has been set up for success like other first round picks, and during the Texans game on Thursday night in week 9, Olu was forced to play 37 snaps at right guard. Olu himself said he had not taken a snap at right guard until he played in that game, meaning he was strictly a tackle all throughout high school and college. Fashionu has also played 198 snaps, so he has taken significantly less snaps than some of his fellow 2024 linemen, and he's only 21 years old, and I always thought this was going to be a bit more of a project pick than some people would have liked. He certainly has had some welcome to the NFL moments during his first few games as a Jet, but my pre-draft thoughts of Olu are still the same, and I think he will be a good player for a long time. But he has struggled at times, and for now, this is a C+. As mentioned in the intro, Vikings quarterback J.J. McCarthy unfortunately suffered a season-ending knee injury and was also expected to be a backup to Sam Darnold for the majority of the year, even if he was healthy, and this is an incomplete grade. Rome Adunze was the second Washington Husky taken in the 2024 draft, and through eight games, Rome has nearly 400 yards and a singular touchdown. Entering the year, Rome was always going to be limited in regards to the numbers he could put up. It wouldn't be fair to sit here and compare Rome to Malik Neighbors, knowing how many more targets Neighbors was going to receive than Rome. In fact, Rome is currently 58th in the NFL in targets and has just 44 in the year. What also has to be remembered is this was a selection made so that Caleb Williams and Rome could grow together, as each player is only 22 years old. And while the offense hasn't lived up to the expectations they had entering 2024, that's not exactly Rome's fault, and he already has two 100-yard games in a relatively limited role. He also has Keenan Allen and DJ Moore to take targets away from him, so he was never going to be a record-breaking rookie. I think he's played fine, not elite by any means, and half a year this is a B grade. Michael Penix has thrown one pass and is technically tied for the career NFL completion percentage record at the moment, so Falcons fans, run with that while you can, but as mentioned in the intro, this is an incomplete grade. 
J.C. Latham was the Titans' first round pick and the second tackle taken in the top seven. I was a little surprised Latham was taken at number seven as I thought he was going to go in the 10 to 12 range, but he's been a solid player for the Titans through the first half of the year. We often talk about setting quarterbacks up for success, and especially young quarterbacks, but I don't think J.C. is really set up for success from a roster standpoint. The Titans have been very frustrating in 2024, and it's not just a quarterback problem, it's also an offensive line problem. JC has given up a fair amount of pressures on the stat sheet, but a decent amount of them were because the quarterback walked right into them. From the being set up for success standpoint, having Bill Callahan teach JC from the start is great for him as he can mold him from being a 21-year-old rookie to an eventual above average and maybe even a great starter. He definitely can work on some things in the ground game, but I like what I see from JC through the first several games of his career, and I'm looking forward to the second half of his rookie season. A B-plus grade. Malik Neighbors was one of the best receiving prospects over the past 10 years, and the only real weakness I had on Malik Neighbors' scouting report when he was coming out of LSU was that he was in the same draft class as Marvin Harrison Jr., and he's played like a can't-miss prospect through the first several games of his career. Neighbors has unfortunately missed a few games, but he has 55 receptions in the first seven games of his career, and if this were to translate to a full 17-game season, he would be on pace for over 130 receptions and over 1,300 yards. He is by far the best player in the Giants offense, and we all know the Giants have struggled over the past several years, but they did not miss on this pick. Neighbors fell into their laps and received permission to wear number one from the family of Ray Flaherty, and if it weren't for a tremendous rookie season from his collegiate quarterback, I think Neighbors would be in the Rookie of the Year discussion. He is a very bright spot on what is a not good football team, and is averaging nearly 80 yards per game. His fellow LSU receivers Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson averaged 85 and 80 87 yards per game as a rookie, but Neighbors' quarterback play is nowhere near Burrow in 21 or Kirk Cousins in 2020. Regardless, Malik makes it happen every week, and this is an easy A plus grade. Joe Alt has been a really good player for the Chargers through the first half of his rookie season. He unfortunately missed the Kansas City game in week four, but when he's been in the lineup, he has been a good player. For reference, he has allowed 10 pressures and 243 pass blocking snaps, which for any player is good, let alone a 21-year-old rookie. He was often referred to as the best tackle prospect since Panay Sewell, and Panay is in his fourth season, and for reference, Panay has allowed eight pressures on 253 pass blocking snaps. The only thing I would nitpick on Alt is he has allowed multiple sacks early in his career, and that's going to happen. Defensive players, and especially pass rushers, are paid to make plays too. I'm sure we all saw the sack TJ Watt got him on, and most recently against Miles Garrett too. I think he is a very good tackle, and if you want to give him an A-plus grade, by all means go for it, but I am trying to keep the A-pluses for the truly rare rookie offensive lineman. Think Quentin Nelson back in 2018, for example. I think Alt could easily be an A-plus at season's end, but for now, we are going with an A. Marvin Harrison Jr. has had an up-and-down rookie year, and I think that's putting it mildly. He had the one catch for four-yard NFL debut where everyone was talking about his first game, and there were a whole bunch of next-gen stats with his speed and how people were legitimately concerned after one game. To be honest, I thought that was ridiculous. Marv responded with a 130-yard, two-touchdown performance in Week 2, and even had four total touchdowns in the first four games of his career, but there was a dry spell for him where he hauled in just five catches for 57 yards in a span of three games, smack in the middle of his rookie year, and granted he did leave one game early in the game, and really early. I am under the belief the Cardinals should do whatever it takes to get Marv the football, because I think he is a rare talent, but he hasn't come close to maximizing what he can do as a pro yet. Right now, Marvin is on pace for 841 yards, but I still think he can be a 1,000-yard rookie receiver, and he should be because the talent is undeniable. He currently has two 100-yard games in his first nine played, and I think we will see a big second half from him, an A-minus grade. Drake May has only started four games, so for clarity, we are grading him on what we've seen and not saying, well, his stats are significantly worse than Jaden Daniels, so it's an automatic F. We all knew entering Drake's rookie year that the situation he was entering was not ideal, and it hasn't been ideal through his first four starts, whether it being due to the offensive line or due to poor receiving play. 
For reference, in the second Jets game before leaving with a concussion, Drake May threw six passes, and of the three incomplete passes he had in this game, two of them were dropped. I think there's been a lot of good flashes from Drake May so far in his career that I am buying in on him as a player, but the current situation he's in is awful. There's no way to accurately judge what type of player he can be at the NFL level when he doesn't have time to throw the ball and his receivers aren't getting open, at least consistently either. He's thrown six touchdowns so far and has added another one on the ground and has been one of the very few bright spots for New England, and we're giving this a B grade. Jaden Daniels was the number two overall pick from LSU, and when this pick was made, I was happy for Commanders fans that they were finally getting a young quarterback to build around and to cheer for. As we know, the Commanders fan base has been through it over the past few years, and I was also excited for Terry McLaurin to finally have a competent quarterback. But I underestimated just how good Jaden would be in his rookie year. He is completing passes at an unreal rate of 71.5%, and he is on pace for over 3,600 yards and 17 passing touchdowns touchdowns, all while throwing just four interceptions. Jaden is also a very good dual threat player and is on pace for over 850 rushing yards and eight rushing touchdowns. In back-to-back -back years now, we have seen the number two overall pick completely transform a franchise and look like they are going to be there for not just four or five years, but for the next decade. It's not an exaggeration to say Washington hasn't been this excited since RG3's rookie season 12 years ago. This team is also 7-2 for the first time since 1996, which was a couple of years before Jaden was born, and I think we can all agree with this one. An easy A+. Caleb Williams was the number one overall pick and was the best quarterback prospect since Trevor Lawrence, but there was a lot of hype heading into Caleb's rookie year, and I mean a lot. This was by far the best situation a number one overall pick had ever been in as a rookie, and the Bears fan base expected big things, and right away. Unfortunately, Caleb didn't throw his first touchdown pass until week three, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster throughout the first half of his rookie year. I still think Caleb is going to be fine, and I think he will be the Bears franchise quarterback for several years but the coaching situation he has is not ideal, and it's fair to say the Bears are not maximizing Caleb's talents, and to be honest, that part is downright frustrating. I think Caleb is one of the harder picks to grade because the flashes have certainly been there, whether it was in the Jags game, or the Colts game, or even the Panthers game. I also think it would be ignorant to say, well, Caleb's coaches haven't helped him out as much as they could, and boost his grade because of that. I mean, this is a number one overall pick, franchise-changing quarterback we're talking about. Out. Caleb is on pace for a 3,500 yard, 19 passing touchdown, 11 interception rookie season midway through his rookie year. Right now, this is a B minus. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please like and subscribe, as only about 43% of people watching are subscribed and helps the channel tremendously. Until next time, please be safe and have a great day. Love you guys.